This is track six, in Pat Pond by Mills and Rafael. So. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our presentation today. Um, in this presentation, we will be talking about uh, the security research that we have performed in payment terminals. Um, we'll, we'll share with you how much fun we have had um, looking at this technology. What we will cover? Um, well, we'll have an introduction first. Um, we'll see why we decided to uh, look at payment terminals and um, the approach that we took for looking at these devices and finding software vulnerabilities. And we look at the payment terminal ecosystem and we'll see the different components that form the payment terminal ecosystem and how do they tie together. Um, then we'll move, move on to chip and pin and EMV. We won't go too much in detail on EMV and we will just be focusing on the aspects that are relevant for this presentation. Then we'll describe on details, in detail um, the approach that we took for testing EMV. We'll have three different case studies um, for three different uh, uh, widely used terminal uh, currently. Um, for these three case studies, we'll have a demo for each of them, so I hope you guys enjoy. Um, and just at the end, we'll have a, a conclusion. Um, we'll discuss the future work that we plan to do on, on this research, and we'll have some time for questions and answers. My name is Rafa. Um, I work as a security consultant and security researcher for MWR Info Security in the UK. I've done some innovative research in the past on the areas of USB, uh, finding and exploiting vulnerabilities in USB drivers, and also in smart card software, um, finding and exploiting vulnerabilities of software that handles input um, that come from, from the smart card itself. Hi, uh, my name is Niels. Um, I'm heading the research at MWR. Um, some of you might have seen uh, the exploits I've demonstrated at uh, Pound Town 2009 and 2010. And since then, I've focused mostly on Android security um, research. Uh, both Rafa and I give the um, Android security workshop as well. So why research per payment terminals? Well, we realized that um, Android exploited wasn't as, um, as much money as we thought. Um, um, no, seriously now. Um, payment terminals are, are widely used. Um, rarely you will see, you will go for dinner and pay with cash or, go, or do shopping and pay with cash. People normally use their debit card or credit card. Personally, I, I even sometimes pay a single coffee with, with, my, with my card. Um, they are also attractive because of the data that they handle, um, the transactions that they process, payment transactions, and they are very attractive for an attacker, um, primarily from a financial perspective. Um, the payment authorization mechanism from the point of view of a, of a merchant or a retailer, the person that has to use the, the device, when he sees in the, in, on the display um, payment successful, um, that retailer trusts that terminal as being a successful payment. Because they are more and more powerful and they have uh, more functionality. Um, and with more functionality, the attack surface, the attack surface increase. We we'll see payment terminals that has wireless, uh, Bluetooth, um, they can be uh, administered remotely, um, they can render the adverts, um, and this, all this helps to the, to the attack surface of the device. And because it's a single point of fa failure uh, for the merchant and the card holder that is using uh, these devices for electronic payments. There have been, been previous attacks, and these have been focused on uh, hardware mainly. Um, we have seen terminal skimming, uh, where uh, the hardware is modified to gather this data. Some of these uh, techniques are um, uh, relatively advanced, where they gather information and then they send this information via wireless or Bluetooth to the attacker. A little bit more of a, a less elegant attack are uh, attackers that actually um, uh, replace entirely the device for a malicious device that um, is uh, identical to the legitimate, legitimate terminal, terminal itself. Uh, we have seen also more sophisticated attacks uh, where a malicious developer or engineer actually manipulate the application or develop an application that um, uh, gather information about uh, the payment transactions. Um, there is a very good uh, or interesting paper from uh, MasterCard um, titled Understanding Terminal Manipulation at the Point of Sale. And this talks um, a little bit about this uh, type of, uh, of attacks. Um, something that is very interesting is uh, 
uh, when it talks about what criminals do uh, to gather information and how they go to uh, uh, internet uh, oceans to actually purchase these uh, 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 payment terminals. Um, so they can gather information on how do they work and the technology that they use. And so the attacks can be more targeted. Um, in the same way, um, this uh, paper also describes uh, 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 a little bit about how um, they will also target uh, specific payment terminals that are used in a specific retailer uh, shop. Um, this is something very interesting that we found on the internet in a, in a forum post uh, from a freelancer. Um, I'll, for those that cannot read it from the far, he's basically say, uh, uh, it's a, uh, asking for, for someone to do a job. The budget is between $3,000 and $5,000. Uh, we need someone who can modify a payment terminals um, so that it will record track one, track two, and ping for debit. Credit card transaction and yeah, credit card transaction. Need to print out receipt and need to have a menu for debit card and credit. Um, if card with chip is entered, it should say error. Please, please swipe card. That's not dodgy at all, is it? <laughs> so we can see that there is people out there already um, putting some intelligence on how to um, perform this or perform this type of attacks and actually look at. Um, how attacking these payment terminals. So where securities? Well, payment terminals are essentially a small computer. Um, they run a payment terminal application um, to handle the payment transactions. And as, as any other computer uh, that takes data and process data um, and run applications, uh, there are software vulnerabilities. The attack surface uh, can be based on the hardware peripherals that are on the device such as the magnetic stripe, um, chip and ping, the network communication, uh, serial port, JTAG, setup menu, if the attacker has got access to, to physical access to the, to the device itself. The research approach that we took was to, um, to see if it was possible to find software vulnerabilities in these payment terminals. The approach that we took was completely from a black box per 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 perspective. Um, and uh, only using public available information that is available to anyone in the, uh, on the internet. Although it would have been very useful to have access to the uh, SDK of some of these terminals, um, uh, this would also put us under an NDA and we wouldn't be able to share this information with you today, guys. Um, for this at, uh, research, um, we purchased a, a, a payment terminals uh, mainly from uh, eBay and um, other providers which would rather prefer to meet up in a car park and they would only accept cash. Uh, um, using second-hand terminals from, uh, from eBay um, is very interesting because um, in the majority that we have purchased, uh, they were already set up for payments. They have a payment uh, application installed and they were ready to go. So anyone up for a refund? <laughs> um, so they were configured. Basically, what has been happening is that um, it's relatively easy to get these terminals from the uh, internet and relatively cheap, mainly because with the recession and a lot of retailer companies going into administration, um, we have a situation where these uh, terminals are being uh, uh, treated as asset, which people just remove from the shop when they go into administration and they just sell it. And there doesn't seem to be a control where these terminals are wiped before, before they go on, 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 on oceans. Um, this picture here um, is our lab. As you can see, there is different type of terminals from different vendors with different uh, functionality. Some of uh, them are chip and pin, other are, are signature-based uh, payment terminals. Um, and this picture actually uh, reflects uh, very well uh, the current uh, share market of payment terminals in the UK. The common setups that we have seen um, are as follow. And we've seen uh, dump terminals that are con connected to a post system, being the post system, the uh, PC that the uh, uh, person in the shop actually uh, perform the, the, the payment tra transactions. These dump terminals are actually very simple, and there's very little functionality within them. Most of the core payment functionality is happening in the post. Um, the post sends commands to the, uh, to the terminal, and the terminal it basically acts as a 
um, interface for the user to enter the card. We've seen other type of terminals that are more powerful and more of the core functionality is happening uh, within the terminal itself where, the pay uh, where they will have a payment application running that will handle the payment transactions. These payment uh, applications can come uh, from the vendor, um, third parties that have access to the SDK and they develop applications, or they are slightly modified vendor applications with um, the company logo or the welcome message. Um, the way these terminals uh, connect, and we've seen they uh, can connect to internal systems or they can connect to third party uh, providers um, going through, through the internet. So this is the payment terminal ecosystem where the different parties uh, that handle payment terminals live. We have the manufacturer who um, design and manufacture the payment terminals. The manufacturer will provide the terminals to the acquirer. The acquirer acts as a third party company um, who um, sell services to the retailer, such as setting up the terminal, um, personalizing the uh, payment applications, um, doing any general maintenance service that are required, and the retailer is actually the consumer of the, those payment terminals. Um, the ones that are going to be using these terminals to take a, 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 a payment trans transactions. The manufacturer also provide the SDK and the required um, development tools for the developer to develop the application and sign the applications. The developer will develop applications for the acquirer and for the retailer. We've seen in cases where actually the manufacturer can de deal uh, straight away with the retailer and provide all these services in one. Um, one particular focus of our research was um, um, chip and pin payments, so where a smart card is used to make the payment. Um, some of you might not have come across that, especially if you're from the US, so we'll give a quick introduction of what, what that is. So chip and pin payments are a major improvement of, over Maxstripe payments. Um, it's very widely implemented in Europe. Uh, in the UK, for example, every single payment will be a chip and pin payment unless you have a credit card from the US or from other countries that don't do chip and pin. Um, basically, the payments are split up between offline and online payments. For an offline payment, the payment terminal itself will verify the, uh, the authenticity of the, of the card and the user will verify the pin against the card. And with online payments, the terminal will connect back to the bank or to the payment provider and the payment provider will provide authorization for this payment. Um, compared to the Max Stripe, the, the chip allows for much better user authentication. Um, it can, for one, one, from one point of view, it can hold much more static data which uh, authenticates the card, so much more information that, uh, will, that can be signed by the bank, for example, to say and this is a valid card or signed by the card issuer. Um, and it also actively um, allows you to sign payments. So a card is now able to sign information which represent the payment uh, by generating a so-called cryptogram. Um, in the case of chip and pin payments, the one side is a chip, the other side is a pin. And the pin number uh, now replaces signature or IDs which are um, commonly used in the US for uh, authentication of, of cardholders. Um, Quite interestingly, the U.S. is also about to, or there are a lot of discussions around adapting chip and pin and making chip and pin payments mandatory, uh, while it is already mandatory in, in a lot of other countries in the world. Uh, really, really quick, um, just to understand the, the next few slides as well, an introduction into smart cards and how smart cards communicate with host systems such as payment terminals. Uh, when you insert a smart card into a, uh, a payment terminal, it is powered up by the payment terminal, and as the first response to this powering up, the smart card will send an answer to reset to the device. And this answer to reset will hold information about the protocols that are spoken by the, uh, by the smart card, um, the, the type, of, um, uh, type of smart card, um, and an ID for, for the type of smart card as well. And then the, the host or the payment terminal um, always sends commands uh, commands are APUs, which is short for application data, protocol data units, and the host system will all, always send these APUs uh, to the smart card. 
and the smart card only ever responds to requests sent by a host. So the, the smart card itself is never initiating any, um, any communication. Um, the de facto standard for chip and pin payments is EMV, which is short for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. So this is a standard created by the uh, most prominent uh, card issuers. Um, it is used for mostly for, for credit and debit cards, but also um, for gift cards. So you might go into a, a shopping mall and might, might buy a gift card there, and that will use the same standard. Uh, very interestingly, um, NFC payments very, very often use EMV as well as an underlying protocol for communicating between the NFC reader and the NFC uh, smart card. And there are some older implementations, uh, specifically in the US, which use older protocols, but nowadays almost all, all of them use um, EMV for communication. And EMV defines aspects of this communication between the smart card and the payment terminal, such as uh, multiple card applications. So you can, theoretically, you can have one credit card which has a Visa application and a MasterCard application and some other payment applications on this card. And uh, while making the, uh, the, the payment, the terminal decides which of these uh, so-called uh, applications to select for, for making the payment. Um, and it holds um, a lot of data which ident identifies the card and which gives the terminal more information about the card. And this will include um, not the PIN, the uh, primary account number, the PIN is not stored as data, obviously, in there, uh, expiry date, and then also information um, which um, specify what uh, specific methods for car cardholder verification are supported by the, uh, by, uh, by the smart card and other things. Um, and it also defines how pins are verified and, and several other aspects as well. And there's a, um, uh, a very useful resource on the internet, which is uh, emvlab.org, and that gives you a lot of information on how EMV works, uh, what kind of tags are, uh, are used to store the data, and what data is stored on these cards. Um, for us, specifically interesting when, when we were doing this research were the EMV records. In this case, a uh, payment terminal is issuing several read records commands against a smart card, and it responds with uh, the EMV records, which are stored in a TLV data format. So you have tag length value, which we see in ASN1, for example, quite often. And parsing of these, these uh, kind of data, which you have seen also in ASN1 fairly often, is, is quite error prone, because you have the length specified and then a value which doesn't necessarily need to match the length and so on. And this is an example of how data can be stored on a card. Um, it is, uh, so so these, these data structures can also be nested. So we see a record template first, and then the expiry date, effective date, and the primary account number as well. So that's all stored in, in these uh, records on the card. Um, if you want to know more about how these uh, payment terminals are implemented, how chip and pin uh, payments are often implemented, and a lot of information about EMV and the whole um, process of implementing EMV, that's a very good book to, to, to read up on this, um, Implementing Electronic Card Payment Systems by, by Christian Radu, and that was very helpful in our research as well. So the next thing we did um, well, was to test how these smart cards communicate with the payment terminals and to see how they communicate with the payment terminals in order to find issues in this communication. Um, our first approach was uh, man in the middle link smart card communication. Um, this device, some of you might have seen if you uh, were or are into satellite TV hacking. Um, it's a device which you plug into, uh, into any, any smart card host device and then you plug the smart card into this device and connect it with a serial port to your to your PC, um, and theoretically it should show you the communication. Uh, however, we found this uh, to be very depending on the timing of the payment terminal and timing of the card, and we got it to work on some terminals with some cards, but it was, wasn't very reliable. Um, there's another solution for that um, uh, called the Smart Card Detective, uh, which we weren't able to get hold on for this research, unfortunately. Um, so we had to find another way of doing this. And what we decided to do is to implement a smart card which locks commands sent to the smart card by a payment terminal and also is programmable by us to program it with 
uh, with responses to respond to a payment terminal. Um, we decided to go for a sequence of responses. So basically, you have two options here. You can say that you want uh, the smart card to respond to specific, um, sp specific requests in, in, in that way, um, which is not the best way of doing that we found for EMV, because you might have requests which, based on the st current state of the card, result in different uh, responses. So we decided to program it with a sequence so a static sequence of responses. So answer to the first request with this response, answer to the second request with this response. And we found that if you, if you use the same card against the payment terminal, that this sequence will always be the same. So that worked well for us. Um, just from a practical point of view, for the implementation, we use basic cards, which is basically basic programming on smart cards, which is kind of ugly, but much easier to set up uh, than Java cards. Um, Actually, in setting up a uh, development environment, especially when working with multi multiple people on a project for Java cards, which works for everyone, is um, probably impossible. Um, so, so we decided to go for basic cards, which comes with a very well integrated development environment, which you can straight away install. And then you have to program basic, but, but it's still better than setting up Java card development environments. So basically what, what happens um, and how we, how we uh, manage to, to see the communication between a payment terminal using this smart card is as follows. We plug in our program basic card uh, with our specific program which does the logging and which can hold a sequence of responses. We plug that into a payment terminal. It will then log all the commands sent to it um, by the payment terminal on the card. And in the next step, we plug it back into our PC and to this PC, we have a valid card, so a valid credit card connected as well. And uh, the PC will now replay all the uh, requests it has seen from the payment terminal. It will um, replay them back to the valid card and store the, the responses it sees from the valid card back onto um, our basic card. And then we repeat the process un until um, we don't get any new requests that are sent by the payment terminal, and we can, um, we can th this way then we can build a, a card which works against payment terminals, and which at least kind of clones the card. It won't clone the card up to a point where you can actually make payments with it, because there's some crypto magic happening as well. However, you can clone it so that you can get fairly deep down into the protocol and look at the protocol and look at what is happening in this communication. So and that's basically what we used to look at, at several payment terminals. Uh, we, in this presentation, we included three of our uh, payment terminals that we have been looking at. Um, so these, these payment terminals, we, so we, as we said, we looked at a bunch um, of payment terminals. And um, our research was fairly goal-driven. So we wanted to find and exploit the sec uh, some security, software security vulnerabilities in these payment terminals. Um, and these were the terminals where we first were able to, to get some progress, to get some understanding of how they work, and find, find vulnerabilities in them as well. Um, all the vulnerabilities are currently with the vendors. Um, and as, uh, one of the vulnerabilities is patched already, which is quite impressive. Um, and um, for in our presentation, we don't want to name and shame any vendors, uh, specifically because we don't have a fair view. So we can't say we have tested all the payment terminals in, in the same manner because we went for the first ones where, where we got lucky and found vulnerabilities. Um, and because the vulnerabilities are not patched yet, and even though there's a patch for one vulnerability, it will take, um, uh, I, I suppose it will take quite a while to patch these in every shop that is out there, so we won't include any uh, uh, vulnerability details either. So the first payment terminal is this one. Um, you might have come across this terminal if you, if you like to buy your coffee at your coffee shop around the corner on, on any corner here in the US. Um, and, and this terminal is, um, so it's very widely used in, in, the, in the UK as well. It's used in the US. In the US, you would stripe your card. In, in the UK, you will use chip and pin on these terminals. Um, it is actually connected, often connected through Ethernet, so it has an Ethernet port on the back, um, a serial port, um, it has a built-in modem to, to talk through the phone line, um, and an integrated printer as well. 
The first thing that we were able to do, and uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you will have seen this picture, was to trigger a, a stack-based buffer overflow through the network communication uh, of these terminals. Um, fairly straightforward stack-based stack buffer overflow with a lot of control on our side. So we, we almost were able to get any characters in there, any lengths of data, basically the perfect situation for us. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we focus on this terminal then. Um, this stack-based buffer overflow we were then able to use by sending a lot of data in there. And um, so, so on, on this screen, what you see is uh, only very limited information. Of, of, and that was all the debugging information that was available to us as well. So we didn't have a debugger running on the devices. We didn't have um, more registers than this or a more detailed bug report. The only thing that we had, had was a status re register, a program counter, link register, and the address that led to the crash. Um, um, by sending in a lot of data, in, uh, um, we, we made it to, to crash not while, while returning from the function, which had the stack buffer overflow in it, but instead crash at the end of the stack. And that gave us an idea where the stack is located on these devices, at which address range, which then allowed us to jump into the stack. You won't see any of the, um, any of the memory protections that are common in, in computer or um, uh, mobile phone systems. Um, so we were able to execute code now on this device. But we didn't have much information what code to execute. From this error log, we, we can make a good guess and say this is an ARM platform, um, which at least allowed, allowed us to, to guess what kind of instructions to execute. But um, we had to do very careful probing and manual, manual, uh, uh, manual memory dumping like you see here. Uh, so that is uh, a partial dump of the stack on the system uh, to give us ideas of where, uh, where, where the, the binaries are located, uh, where, where the heap is located, and so on, um, until we got up to a point where we were able to have enough information about the system, mostly done by manual dumping, to dump the memory back to us, arbitrary memory regions, through the Ethernet connections, through the TCP connections that already existed, because that's what we used to trigger the fault. Um, and that finally allowed us to properly analyze the application. We got an idea how systems call on this um, custom operating system work. Uh, we have never seen any references uh, to, to this specific operating system. Um, for, for all that we know, it's, it's custom to these systems. And it also allowed us to find more weaknesses in the systems. Um, some of them, so in this case, we have a third-party payment application running on there by a third-party payment provider. Um, and in some cases, we found hard-coded passwords in the application. So you, you actually have a check for the um, password from the configuration file, for example, for the setup menu, and then a second check if that fails against the hard-coded value. Um, and we also find, found other vulnerabilities. And we were able to find vulnerabilities in handling of chip and pin payments. So um, the, the question here is how we got the stack dump out of the device. So we were able to execute, so we had some information about memory layout, so we had the stack address already. Um, and then by executing code and executing, so at the beginning you will just end up executing code like if this address contains this value, then go in, into an endless loop and we see the device getting stuck or uh, jump to the value of the address at that address and we will get the error log um, showing you the, the content at this, this address. And then slowly you can prog progress at some point, you get some code back and that gives you an idea of how to print onto the screen. And then finally we were able to use that to dump more data up to a point where we were able to dump that back through the TCP connection and then we can, can basically read all the memory from the device. Um, so the, the first chip and pin vulnerability that we found in here is, so again, a fairly straightforward um, stack-based stack buffer overflow in the handling of EMB uh, text. So that's, that's the records that we have seen previously. And it allows us for arbitrary code execution. Now, for the implementation of um, an exploit against the devices, um, a single response to an, uh, to an APDU request to the smart card won't be enough to hold all the data, especially not in this case where we will only be able to control 40 bytes really after, after triggering the crash. Uh, however, we were able to use these 40 bytes to do return-oriented programming to call the methods that request more data from the smart card 
um, in order to retrieve more data from the smart card, which then contained our second stage of the payload. And the second stage um, was, um, well, around 200 bytes of control data uh, allowed us then to implement a shell code which can almost load an arbitrary amount um, of data from the smart card into the memory and then we are able to execute uh, this as our, our uh, final payload. And in the demonstration that we will show now, um, this payload is actually 870 bytes of ARM SUMP instructions. And that will be our first demonstration. So this is the terminal you already have seen on the picture. Previously, I hope you can um, at least fairly well see the screen, but that should be fine. And in this case, we demonstrate um, how to use a malicious smart card. Uh, this is our malicious smart card. Uh, does anyone recognize the game? <laughs> Very good. So we start a, a payment process on the device. In this case, it con tries to connect to the bank network. Um, obviously, we haven't connected these systems to a bank network, but this one is set up to accept offline payments as well, and that's what we will do now. So we start an offline payment. It will be a sale in, or anyone after a refund. Um, we start a, uh, start a sale, enter an amount, and that would, would be what is happening in an actual shop. So um, the merchant will start the payment process, uh, enter a reference number, and then uh, the customer is asked to insert or swipe the card, uh, this, this payment terminal was used in the UK, so we insert a chip and pin card, uh, which is this specific card. And that will trigger the stack-based buffer overflow through, um, through um, the, the weaknesses in the smart card handling on this device. We'll insert, insert the card, uh, we'll, we'll read the data from the device, and then it starts the racing game on the device. <laughs> And game over. And also, quite interestingly, on the card printer, we see how it prints the score. Uh, in this case, 46. Um, the record in the office is at 715, um, which is very impressive. Um, Gameplay on these devices is, ac is actually quite good, and they are powerful, <laughs> powerful enough to run these kind of games as well. to the presentation. So our first demonstration. Um, that's what you see on the terminal, uh, printing of the score, and the MWL Labs Pinpad Racer game. And that's the card that was used to trigger this issue. So what have you seen here? We have code execution in the context of the payment application. Um, we reported this issue to the vendor, and the vendor is currently working on a fix. Um, interestingly, so. Okay, this was a game, but the only, uh, playing a game on these devices is not the only thing that you can do with this kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, we use this game to demonstrate that we have full control over the printer and the display on these devices. If you now wear a merchant and the display says that the payment has been approved uh, in the same way as the actual application does, and it prints out a valid receipt, then you probably think that the payment got approved, uh, but there won't be any money uh, arriving on, in your bank account. Um, We'll see some more uh, practical payloads later on. Uh, so, so this one, uh, what we demonstrated here was a weakness in the payment application that runs on the payment terminal. Um, uh, we, we will cover operating system in future work later on. Um, so in the, the next case study um, will be presented by Rafa. So this payment terminal here is a little bit um, more different to the one that Nils uh, just uh, presented. Um, these are widely used in the US, where chip and pin is not established yet, um, where you use basically signature uh, uh, payment, uh, based payments. Um, they have a nice touch screen, full color, where you can actually use to, to sign your, your payment. Um, they have a 32-bit ARM processor. Um, they run embedded Linux. Um, they also have PC box installed, which, as you can imagine, is very, very useful. And these terminals, I would say, are more, the ones that are more uh, similar to a computer itself. Um, 
the hardware peripherals um, add to the attack surface. Um, some of them have um, a smart card reader, um, SIM card reader, uh, magnetic card reader for the signature payments. They can also have contactless payments if they require NFC hardware is plugged into it. They will have a USB port, Ethernet port, and RS-232. There's two um, interesting security features in this um, uh, payment terminal. The first one is binary signing for the application, for the payment application. So um, to protect against a applica payment application a tampering for malicious purposes. Um, physical tamper protection mechanism, uh, which is a pain if you drop the device on the floor. Um, these payment terminals come with a built-in uh, application from the, men from the vendor, which are used to uh, manage the terminal when you have physical access to it. Um, this built-in application also allows, to, uh, allows you to set up a lot of configuration settings and also allows you to configure the device to be, re uh, remote, uh, to be managed remotely. Um, uh, on top of that, we will have the payment application which handles the, the payment transactions and is what the user will be uh, uh, basically exposed to. Um, there are very interesting functionality in this terminal. Um, they render multimedia adverts, so when you are uh, purchasing uh, with these terminals, you can actually be seeing uh, adverts with it. And they have a remote administrative interface, so retailers um, that has 300 of these payment terminals can actually manage this device from a centralized location, and they can um, connect to the internet. Um, if the device is set up in a local network, they won't, um, but if, they, if these devices uh, need to connect to a remote interface that is on the internet, they, they will be able to connect to those devices. And the demo that we're gonna be seeing, so, So this is the payment terminal. Um, as we can see, there is a. Uh, let me just say this appropriately. This is the building application that the um, administrator will use to manage the devices. Um, here we can see the different functionality that is available. Um, you can set up FTP. It looks very much like a, a, the functionality that you will find in a in a, in a Linux system. Um, you can set up. Um, debug functionality, you can enable telnet. Um, what we are going to be doing um, is uh, restarting the device. And the demonstration that we are gonna uh, show here is how we can exploit um, weaknesses in the network communication between the device and the remote administrative server that these devices connect to. So these devices actually act as a client. Um, when they require um, a, a administrative functions, they will attempt to connect to the remote uh, server. Um, what we are doing here for the, uh, for the purpose of the demo is rebooting the device. Um, we, this, the, user won't, the user or the customer in the shop would actually not be seeing this. They will be exposed with the payment application, for just, but, but just to demonstrate that um, the communication is happening at reboot and can be also set up in periodic times to connect to the administrative server, um, we are going through through this interface. Essentially, um, these network, network weakness, these uh, weaknesses in the network communication um, could allow an attacker to um, uh, spoof the remote server and launch uh, an attack to the payment terminal uh, itself. Um, this is basically using functionality available on the built-in application. So it takes a little bit of time to boot up. I was expecting that. So it's almost there. So now we can see that um, the application, the terminal is booting up. And now what it's gonna be trying to do is to connect to the remote uh, administrative server. So what we do from here is to um, impersonate uh, the remote server. We have our malicious script that we can run. We specify the IP address of the client, the terminal, our IP address. Uh, 
and we launch the attack. Now the impersonation is happening, and we'll be launching our malicious application into the terminal. So your question was whether the, um, it, it's not so a, signature, a, digna, a digital signature is required for the application that run on these devices. Um, for legitimate applications, it is. Uh, if you decide not to go through the normal startup process of application and start directly from the underlying operating system, and the, this signature is not enforced. Um, what our payload has also done is to enable Telnet on the remote device and change the root password of the device. So we can do that. And luckily that allows us to stop that demo as well. So what we have seen in this demo is a full system compromise. We have been able to run our unsigned application with the access that we have had to the device. We have changed the root password, the root password uh, on the device and also enabled Telnet, which allow us to uh, connect remotely. And that leads us to our third and, and last demonstration on another payment terminal. And this is a, uh, the specific payment terminal. Um, very popular in the UK, um, I've, I've seen it in the US as well, and um, has uh, similar sorts of connectivity, um, Ethernet port, serial port, uh, and so on. Um, it runs uh, um, the vendor software, um, however, a slight modification of the vendor software by a payment provider. Um, um, it uses the same custom operating system, uh, maybe a newer version of that, as, as the terminal in our first demonstration, um, which actually helped quite a lot because we, by now we understand that um, operating system fairly well. Um, the, the same application is used on multiple devices, so it's not specific to this device, the demonstration. It is uh, uh, specific to uh, the payment application used on these devices. Um, and when we were looking at, uh, at finding flaws in the um, chip and pin parsing, we noted that the code quality for parsing um, the EMV protocol was considerably be be better than uh, on the first terminal that we were looking at. Um, still, we were able to find um, vulnerabilities, and those vulnerabilities were deeper down in the protocol, and they weren't as straightforward to find or exploit as uh, the, the previous vulnerabilities. Um, Interestingly, we again found, so first of all, on almost all of the terminals that we bought off, uh, off eBay, we found that uh, the default passwords are not changed by the people that are using these terminals, which is quite shocking. But then also there are hard-coded passwords. In this case, there uh, is uh, the so-called super mega password, uh, which can be disabled in the configuration files, but wasn't disabled in any of the cases that we have seen. And that will allow you to get around any password prompt on the device. So that's our third demonstration then. Bear with me a second to get that up. Okay, we've got a lot of reflection here. I think that works fairly well. Um, the, the stripe of, of tape you see on there is because this 
for this demonstration, we will use an actual credit card. And I really would prefer if not all of you have my credit card number, or at least the number for this specific card. Um, so what we do in this, uh, in this presentation is we have a f our first card, um, which looks like this. Uh, so that is Tinkerbell. And Tinkerbell will go ahead and put the pixie dust into the device. Uh, the pixie dust, in this case, being um, uh, uh, so some kind of backdoor, which modifies uh, the payment application in a way that after this pixie dust has been put into the device, um, it will record all the credit card numbers and PIN numbers that are put into the device after this. So again, we start a payment process by inserting the card. <coughs> And from the merchant's point of view, the payment process goes ahead as usual. Will, they will put in a value for the, uh, for the transaction. Um, and then it displays card error. Um, a criminal probably now would go ahead and say, oh, um, there must be something wrong with my, my credit card. Can I pay by cash instead and then leave the shop? At this point, our malicious code is on the device and um, it will hook any payments that are, will be happening on the device after this. So we can now go ahead um, with a valid credit card, which is this one, um, and um, make a payment. So the next customer comes into the shop and uses the same device to make a payment on the device. And that payment will go through um, as it normally would. Uh, merchant is asked for the amount of the payment, um, puts that in. And then um, the, the cardholder is asked to put in a PIN. Obviously, they will shield um, the PIN pad and hit Enter. And now it tries to uh, connect to a bank. In this case, it would use the modem to connect to a bank, uh, which is not working because it's not connected to a phone line. It will have several attempts of that and then decline the payment because we weren't able to verify the cardholder. If this uh, device would be connected to a bank, then the payment would go through as uh, as it would normally. And now several other payments can happen. Um, I'll better keep this receipt because it has my card number on it as well. Um, so several payments will happen throughout the day and all of these payments will be locked. Um, and now the, the criminal at the end of the day comes back with a second smart card, which is Winnie, Winnie the Pooh retrieving the honey from the payment terminal. Uh, the honey in this case being credit card numbers and PIN numbers. So Winnie the Pooh goes ahead, uh, makes a payment on the device. Um, and this includes a small demonstration as well because we can now put in a value for the payment. Um, and because we, are, we have control over the payment terminal, um, it did authorize the payment without asking us even for a PIN. So you see a, an auth code there and also uh, it has printed a valid receipt which you see here. Uh, so no cardholder verification was required, and the payment has been approved um, for, so this would usually say MasterCard, and the card number probably shouldn't have 31337 in it. Um, so the, from the point of view of the merchant, this, this payment has been approved. Um, more interestingly for the criminal, it's not that they were able to acquire goods for 10 pounds um, without paying for it. More interestingly is that all the credit card numbers and PIN numbers that have been used throughout the day on this terminal have been locked to uh, the Winnie the Pooh card. So uh, what we do next is um, the criminal will go to their laptop. And um, execute the cash in script with underscore height so that I don't have to show you my credit card number. Um, so that will X out some digits of the, of the credit card and also X out uh, most of the PIN number. Um, criminal will go ahead, uh, insert the, the payment card, uh, the, the malicious second card into the card reader and then execute the script. And that is the locked credit card number and the PIN um, scrambled in this case, um, retrieved back from the, from the payment terminal. So I'll start the demo. 
um, again, Tinkerbell for infecting the device, and Winnie the Pooh for retrieving the C plus, uh, C, um, the, the credit card numbers and the PIN numbers. Um, again, code execution in the context of a payment application, we've demonstrated what else we can do with this kind of pay, uh, uh, code execution. Uh, we can approve payments, um, and we can also um, um, re uh, modify the terminal so it records credit card numbers and PIN numbers. Uh, this vulnerability was reported to the vendor at the beginning of July after we found it, and the, they already have a patch for the is, this issue. That's less than three weeks to, to get the patch for the issue out, uh, which is really uh, quite impressive, especially with um, vendors of embedded hardware we have seen far worse than that. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, it will take some time for all the um, shops and merchants to, to, set, uh, to um, adapt this patch and also to, for the new software version to go through the uh, verification or cert certification processes. Right, what else is there to do? Um, uh, there, there was um, a mention of the operating system and security of the operating system before. Um, so it, from, uh, from what we know, it's a completely custom built. There might be um, privilege escalation vulnerabilities. Uh, you can maybe exploit some of the system calls. Um, something very interesting to look into. Um, firmware updates for the operating system itself. Um, they are signed and encrypted, at least to our knowledge, encrypted. So by, by looking further into the operating system, uh, we might get an idea of, uh, and we, we might be able to verify and this, uh, the signature checks and encryption. And there's a lot of other code in there which is custom to this terminal. We have a custom Wi-Fi stack, Bluetooth stack, and the network stack is uh, customly written and, and um, usually implemented in, the, in user mode as well. Um, there are a lot of other payloads that we can play with, um, uh, properly approving payments so that the merchant will think that this payment was approved using a, a PIN uh, and a valid card uh, without it actually being a valid card. Um, and also, uh, because all of these devices implement signature checks, uh, currently our payloads are not uh, persistent, on, persistent on the device. Um, on reboot, these, these payloads will get lost from the device, uh, which is, from a forensics point of view, great, uh, but maybe not if you want to have a large-scale attacks against these systems. Um, so there are some ideas around how, to, uh, how we might be able to achieve persistence on the devices, for example, modifying the configuration files because they are not signed, and if we trigger issues in the parsing of the configuration files, then we might be able to gain persistence on these devices as well. And then also looking into NFC would be quite interesting. As I said before, most of the NFC payments are made using EMV, uh, the EMV standard as well, so similar issues, or might, maybe even the same issues might work against these devices. Very quick conclusion. Um, there's a lot of trust into these payment terminals. Um, the merchants trust them to tell them whether the, the payment was legitimate, and cardholders trust them with their uh, card details and PIN numbers. They don't have an, another option than doing so. Um, uh, we have seen a lot of cases where the default passwords were not changed. Uh, some of them had hard-coded passwords additionally. Um, and, and we have seen a lot of effort put into the phys physical security, again, skimming and so on, on these devices. Um, it would be good to see a similar effort for the software security as well. Um, and finally, we demonstrated how um, uh, memory corruptions vulnerability in the handling of, of user input, like uh, chip and pin cards, can be used to inject code and run code on these devices. And we have seen some payloads uh, which allow us to exploit that. Any questions? Yeah? Can you turn? Um, we haven't looked into the storage uh, of keys. Um, I would assume they are securely hidden away from the applications. Um, um, but we haven't looked into that at all. Um, yeah. That's another one. So, sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, 
Um, my, my current implementation, but that is um, um, only because I was lazy, will allow you to store something like 20, 30 card, uh, card payments. Uh, my smart card itself has a storage of 60K. Um, I need um, eight bytes to store the card number and currently another four bytes to store the PIN number so you can uh, go on calculations how many that would be. Any other questions? Yeah, so this was a comment around the software updates and how long it will take um, for them to actually get to the, to the merchants. Um, yeah, so, and that it might not happen at all. But we have seen cases like um, in the first demonstration where an update channel through the internet exists by the payment provider. So that might be an opportunity to get patches more quickly to, to the payment terminals as well. Any more questions? So, in, uh, so with, with all of the terminals we have been looking at, you can exchange the application if you have uh, the developer key that is set up on the devices. Uh, and some of them we have seen that happening through, through an internet connection. So the same connection to the payment provider that is used to, to process the payments can also be used to update the devices. So this, it is very dependent on the terminal that you're looking at. Any more questions? Last one. Okay, this question was around whether we were able to uh, make the terminal accept um, offline payments even though it should do an online verification or was configured to do so. Um, with the kind of access that we have, um, it's, it's more about what, what you display on the screen. So we weren't able to approve any payments in the back-end systems at all. And no money will eventually make it to the, to the merchant either. Um, however, what we were able to do is make the merchant think that a payment has been approved. And that you can do with, uh, with whatever payment you want because we control the screen and the printer and we can print that this was an online payment or make it appear that it is connecting to a bank while it isn't. Uh, theoretically, you would probably be able to do so. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't attempted that yet. Any more questions? Thank you.